Hello and welcome to lecture 9, where are we going to come back for a second uh, to chaos. You asked me a lot of questions, how does chaos happen? And so I thought, let me come back and revisit that, uh, just so maybe it will add a little bit more understanding uh, of this really fascinating topic. So now we are in uh, part 1 of lecture 9. Chaos, transition to it. How do we get there? Roots to chaos. So if we recall back how we got to chaos, that was on an example of a driven, damped pendulum. And this chaotic oscillator was basically giving us a continuous mapping between the initial conditions, theta and theta dot, uh, and uh, into theta and theta dot at a later time. So this was at initial time, got mapped into a later time. But it is useful to consider the system uh, not in this continuous remap mode, but rather in uh, a discrete mode. So for instance, uh, we could evaluate the system at time t, whatever time you picked, t plus a period of our uh, driving force, t plus two periods, t plus and periods. And uh, why is this interesting? Well, that's because once the initial conditions are forgotten, then the only thing that changes is the initial forcing, the initial, the external forcing or the external driving that is shaking up our oscillator. And uh, in this case, the beginning of every period is just as good as any other period. And so that is the idea behind the Poincaré sesh, sesh, section. Each period is equivalent to another one. And so what we're going to do is use that in order to reduce a continuous chaotic system to a discrete one. So how will we do that? Well, we, we've actually done that before. And the way we did it was uh, we uh, evaluated the state of the system once every period. And we picked the initial time to be the beginning of the period. So we always evaluated the system in the same phase. You can think of it as you know looking at the behavior of weather on Earth on January 1st every year, instead of bothering with the, with the seasons changing, we on Earth are driven periodically by its orbit around the Sun. So if we forget about that and just evaluate the weather on January 1st every year, well, that takes away uh, the worry about what's happening during the period. And so that's kind of what Poincaré's section does to us. So let us now get a better sense of how this continuous remap the continuous behavior of the system connects to this discrete representation of the system once every period. And for that, I made a few 3D movies, which hopefully will give us some intuitive understanding of what's going on. For that, I will need to clean um, this board a little bit to open up some space, and then that will help us to uh, look at the movies. All right, we're done with cleaning the board. Let me make this into 9.2, uh, just to reflect the fact that uh, we've had to raise the board. 
And now we have switched to the next stage of this lecture, uh, which is the movie stage. All right, so this is going to be pretty cool. Uh, what we're going to do first is we're going to take a look at uh, a non-chaotic oscillator, a period one oscillator. And uh, let us recall uh, what uh, that is. So if we were to draw uh, a uh, Poincaré, uh, sorry, actually not Poincaré, um, Poincaré will be a bit later. Uh, if we were to draw a uh, bifurcation diagram, so that will be theta as a function of the amplitude of the driving force. Uh, then um, for a driven oscillator uh, with the following parameters, with uh, omega d equal to 2 thirds, with Q equal to one half. So that's the driving frequency. Uh, this is the uh, dissipation uh, parameter uh, with G over L equal to one for simplicity. So that omega squared, the natural frequency uh, squared will be equal to one. And with the standard initial conditions, uh, 0.2 for the initial angle and uh, zero for omega. So these are the parameters of our pendulum. So for these parameters, um, if we were to uh, compute a bifurcation diagram, we're going to get something like that. So around uh, uh, the driving force amplitude of 1.4, uh, we're going to get a period one system. Uh, that means that uh, our system has a single period. The period doubling hasn't yet happened. So that uh, every time the force uh, goes through a period, uh, our system responds in exactly the same way. So the system is completely reproducible. It mirrors the behavior of external driving every time in the same exact way. Um, if we go to uh, the higher amplitude of the driving force, 1.45, then we're going to experience period doubling. And in this case, we're going to get a period two behavior, where uh, once a period, the system will do one thing, and uh, uh, in the next period, it will do another thing. So one period does one thing, the other one, the other thing, and then it comes back. So it cycles between two states. Uh, so it kind of has more choices. And then finally, if we go to the driving force of 1.5, uh, then uh, we are going to get into chaos where there are just so many of these states that the system keeps uh, choosing uh, a new one every time and you um, kind of don't know which one it will pick. And so that's what is chaos. Um, so many of these period infinity <laughs> state basically uh, where every period of the driving force, our system reacts uh, potentially differently. And so let us go over one by one and let's take a look at a 3D illustration of this. So uh, this is what I have prepared for us. So let us uh, take a look at this one. Uh, so this is period one uh, system. So it will be exactly periodic. And so what you can see is this is the initial position of our system. Uh, this way goes phi. So let me draw that. So our trajectory will start over here and it will go around in a circle and come back over there. So that will be uh, our phase. It goes around the circle. Um, now I will erase that we will actually see how that works. And what else you can see here is you see 
uh, this sort of uh, rectangle. And this rectangle is actually showing you uh, a Poincaré section, or what will be a Poincaré section. So uh, this is going to show omega plus pi. So the uh, this is going to be the middle will be omega equal to zero. Uh, to the right it will be positive, and to the left it will be negative. So this is minus pi, and this is plus pi uh, for omega. And uh, this is theta. Uh, in fact, uh, this bottom left corner will be theta equal to minus pi, and that upper left corner is plus pi. Um, so omega goes from minus pi to pi, and theta goes from minus pi to pi. So this is a Poincaré section, uh, perhaps um, transposed. Typically, omega is along the y-axis, and theta is uh, along um, the horizontal axis. I did this. W I did it this way just so that um, time or theta goes up, because then it's kind of easier to imagine that time goes up as opposed to to the right. And why I do that is because uh, this little particle will be tracing out um, kind of circles around here. So let's see how it goes. Um, so let me play this movie. So here is our system following a trajectory. Uh, at this point, our theta jumps, it wraps around. Um, and so that's why uh, it kind of comes out from the bottom and comes back from the top and continues going around um, in, a, in this kind of uh, circular pattern or other periodic pattern. And because this is a period one system, nothing is changing. You can see that the system continues tracing out the same exact path over, over, and over again. So this is pretty clear that our uh, three-dimensional space of our system, right? So uh, this is phi, that is theta, and this is omega, uh, gets mapped into this two-dimensional plane, uh, which is happening at phi equal to zero. So this is phi equals to zero plane. So at other phases, we will have different positions of uh, our system in terms of theta and omega. So you can see that our system is tracing out uh, this uh, weird figure uh, if we were to keep track of it in theta omega plane um, all the time and all phases. But if we only evaluate it at one single phi equals zero phase, then we're going to get just one single point. And that's what Poincaré section does. It evaluates the system only at one point. And so what it does, it checks. Is it still the same after one period? Yeah, okay, fine, it's still the same. And so this little yellow dot is an indication that nothing has changed. Our system is period one. Uh, it's always the same every period, it does the same thing. All right, so now let's go to a period two system. How will that be different? So again, this is our initial condition. In fact, uh, it's, uh, it's actually state of the system uh, nine and a half periods after uh, the start with these initial conditions. So. Uh, let's try and do that. And then uh, I run this for until 20, sorry, until 200 periods. So start with nine and a half periods and then uh, run until 200 periods. And starting with period 10, we're starting to see what sort of contributions to Poincaré section uh, will be happening. So uh, let's uh, run our system and see what happens. So you see that we've completed one period. Oh, and the second one is not the same. So you see, this is what happens with period two system. Uh, every time it completes one orbit in this um, uh, 
theta omega space, uh, it comes back but along a different path. And so you can see that it's jumping from one path to the other uh, every time it is going into the next period. Every time it completes an orbit, it uh, hops from one path to the other, of course, smoothly. And if we keep running the system, uh, the same thing will keep going and going and going uh, forever. So we see that the system comes in, uh, goes through our phi equals zero plane. This is uh, our state of the system. And then it hops over to this one. And uh, uh, the system hops between just two points uh, in the point correct section. So uh, this is a period two system. If we were to go uh, to period four system, there would be four uh, points on this plane and so on and so forth. But let me skip over and go directly uh, to period um, infinity system or chaotic system uh, for Q, sorry, for FD equals to one and a half. So uh, that's our state of the system after nine and a half periods from the initial conditions. And let's get it started. So you see that uh, we've gotten one contribution to point cross section. The next period came in on a, on a completely different tra trajectory. And the other one comes and hits in a third point. So what we're doing is uh, we're basically are hopping between all of these different values of theta uh, in this point caress section. Uh, and so every time we're going to hit a new point because the system is chaotic, it's picking um, one state of the system out of an infinite number of states. So that's why we are going to trace out a trajectory. Uh, it's a strange attractor. And by strange, when we say strange, we mean it's um, actually fractal. So if you keep zooming in onto the structure that's currently developing, uh, we're going to see more and more substructure. And if we zoom in onto that substructure, we're going to see even more. Of course, in order to see substructure, we will have to run the simulations for a very long time because uh, uh, the uh, longer we run, the more points in this cross section, in this, in this point caress section we're going to get. One point per period. And so what I'm doing here uh, is I'm showing the old um, holes that our trajectory punched through this point caress section at phi equals zero uh, with the orange uh, dots. And the last two ones I'm showing with the yellow uh, dots. So you can think of these yellow ones as grapefruits and all these orange ones as oranges. So the grapefruits are the last two hits uh, that our Poincaré section has experienced as the orbit uh, passed through it. And so what happens is that uh, this is the last one, the new, the last one, and then now this is a new one. So what these um, grapefruits are telling us is the mapping uh, that is a discrete mapping um, from one beginning of the period to the next. So instead of a continuous mapping uh, from t equal to zero uh, to the current time, we are going to get a discrete mapping uh, from t equal to zero uh, to t uh, to t plus td, t plus 2, td, and so on. So we're going to get a discrete mapping. So by going from a continuous system 
um, too discrete one, we are going to simplify it. We're going to look at just this one cross section that removes all of the rest of the complexity. As you see, the system um, would have tra traced out all of these complex curves in this phi equals zero plane if we kept evaluating it at all the values of um, the phase. But what we do instead is we evaluate it only at the times that our um, 3D trajectory makes a hole, punches a hole in our point caress section. And so what we are getting is instead of going from t equal to zero to t continuously through an, a continuum of different states of the system, we're going to hop over period and we're going to evaluate the system once a period. So what we're going to get is we're going to start at x uh, zero, go to x one, go to x two, go to xn. Um, let me see, I'll be clearer. We're going to skip a few here. So we're going to go to xn and go to xn plus one. So what's really important here is that we can try and study the chaotic nature of the system by looking at the Poincaré section. Um, so we're going to be only interested in the mapping from the previous punch to the next punch. So uh, from the old grapefruit to the new one, to the new one, and then yet to another one. So these are xn and this is x plus one, xn plus one, this is xn plus two, and then now we're going to get xn plus three. So uh, this is the discrete sequence of the states of the system that we're going to be getting uh, in the Poincaré section. And the sequence is going to be chaotic. Um, and what's really cool is that by going to this discrete representation of our system, we actually can study uh, much simpler systems than uh, chaotic oscillator. Uh, and these uh, uh, discrete simpler systems will allow us to gain a lot of interesting insight into the transition to chaos. Uh, it's literally just a series, mathematically defined, and yet it exhibits chaotic behavior that is very, very similar, strikingly similar to our oscillator. So let's try and uh, take a look at that. Before I do that, let me speed up this movie uh, all the way to the end, after 200 periods, to see uh, what our attractor, strange attractor, looks like. Let's do that. Well, you've done it. You see how we can assemble a strange attractor by running our uh, simulation for a longer time, uh, collecting more and more of the hole punches uh, that our trajectory leaves in the point caress section. Uh, and eventually you see this really nice uh, strange attractor that develops. Uh, some of you have explored uh, the properties of this attractor uh, in great detail, and I hope you had a lot of fun. So now, our next step in uh, uh, part three of our lecture nine is to try and understand how does this transition to chaos happen in a much uh, simpler system, um, which is called a logistic map. That is literally a map of a one-dimensional sequence. And we're going to see you right there. Hello and welcome to part three of our awesome lecture nine, where we are going to be talking about discrete chaotic systems on an example of a logistic map.
logistic map is a really simple, discrete sequence. X, N plus 1, and this has to be N, not M, to match the book. Let me avoid confusions and use the same notation. X, N plus 1. Uh, the new uh, element in the sequence is equal to a constant parameter mu times the previous parameter xn in the sequence times 1 minus uh, that same parameter xn. And here our mu will be between 0 and uh, 4 and x will be between 0 and 1. Okay, so this is the range of parameters uh, and variables for which this mapping works. And this is discrete mapping. So what we do is we go from xn, which we we'll plug in here, and we get xn plus 1. And then from here, we're going to go and plug in xn plus 1 here and get xn plus 2. Uh, and so on and so forth. And because this is such a simple mapping, we can actually get a lot of insight into how this uh, sequence of numbers goes chaotic. It has a very similar behavior to the driven pendulum. More specifically, if we were to plot x n versus n, then for mu equals to 2, we would get something that looks like that, where, of course, there are a bunch of values. Uh, it's a discrete sequence. Uh, so that is period 1 behavior, because uh, we have gotten onto a constant, and nothing is changing. Now, if we were to consider mu equals to 3.1, we're going to get a period 2 behavior. So the larger the value of mu, it's kind of the equivalent of the amplitude of the forcing. Um, we will find uh, something that looks like that. So for every n, Uh, for uh, every n, we're going to get a different number, but there are only two different numbers. For even odd n's, the two numbers are all the same. So that is period 2 behavior of the system. And uh, finally, there is another example that is uh, shown in uh, uh, figure 312 in the textbook uh, that uh, for mu equal to 3.8, uh, the behavior is actually uh, chaotic. So what we find, obviously I'm making it up, but you could simulate the system yourself, uh, or you could take a look at uh, figure 312 in the textbook, and uh, it looks something like that, where uh, we no longer have a few um, select states to jump between, like we had in period 2 behavior, or in period 4 there will be 4 states. Here we have a bunch of different states, so we don't quite know at every value of n, the next value of n, where we're going to jump. Of course, it's all deterministic, but if we're just to look at this, it would look random to our eye. So this is the chaotic behavior. Uh, and uh, the closer we come to the maximum value of mu, uh, the more chaotic 
we get. So we start with period one system at low mu, uh, we get to period two system and so on and so forth. We actually are going to go through a buffer bifurcation diagram where you could plot uh, the values of x versus uh, the values uh, of mu and you would find the same exact bifurcation diagram as for a driven pendulum. That's why this is such an interesting system to study uh, because uh, the, they are, uh, the system allows us to, um, to get a lot of insight uh, into the periodic behavior uh, of the more complicated continuous systems, which we evaluate in phase, uh, just like we saw. Uh, in the previous part of this lecture. So what is happening here? How does the system go from being period one to period two to chaotic? Um, if we can't understand what's going on here, there is no hope for us in more complex continuous systems. And so lucky for us, the system is tractable so we can actually watch what's happening precisely so let us first a uh, look at the period one behavior so uh, let's plot uh, x and plus one um, versus um, uh, versus xn so uh, let me see so our xn will go from 0 to 1. Let me get that right. So this would be 0. Uh, that would be 1. That will be 1 half. Um, so what we're going to have is uh, a parabola centered at 1 half um, with a peak. So this will be 0 0.2. This will be 0.4. So this is one half, this will be 0 0.2, uh, and that will be 0 0.8. So we we're going to draw a diagonal, uh, that is xn plus one is equal to xn. We're gonna see why we would need that. Uh, and then we're also going to draw, and I guess let me use a different color. We're going to draw uh, this curve that corresponds to this mapping. It will look something like that. Okay, so it's symmetric. It peaks at one half. Let me mark that this is one half, just to be clear. 0.5, and that's xn. All right, and so uh, now suppose that we started um, with uh, a value at one half over here. And uh, uh, then it means that we would go up and up and up and up. Uh, actually, it's supposed to be a straight line. So we're gonna go along the straight line, which is not straight, but it's supposed to be straight. And we're going to get at this value. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the left because we're going to get this value and plug it back in. So uh, from xn plus one, we need to go back to xn. So that's exactly what we're doing uh, by using uh, this curve, xn plus one equal to xn. And we're going to, basically this will be our new value of uh, xn plus one, um, which plays the same role of xn. Um, and we're going to evaluate the value over here and that way we're going to go all the way down. So that's the trajectory. Up, left, down, left, down, and we're going to converge uh, onto this fixed point. And uh, at this fixed point, what we get is that x star is equal to f of x star so that the value of x stays invariant as we go through uh, this uh, mapping. And that is for mu equal to two. That is the fixed point that we see over here. So what happens when we go to higher value of mu? Mu equals to 3.1.
let's try that. Uh, so that will actually be 0.8. Uh, that will also be 0.8. That will be 1. Uh, that will be a straight line. Uh, and uh, we're going to draw uh, the, uh, the curve over here, except that now it peaks at uh, one half, which is right here, uh, and it peaks at 0.8. So it's going to do something like this. Okay, it's supposed to be symmetric. So now what we're going to do is start somewhere around here, uh, go up, go over here, go over here, go over here, and we basically are going to get stuck in a loop. Uh, so that will be our uh, trajectory. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be jumping between these two fixed points. Uh, of which they actually are now not even two, but three, because that would be a fixed point as well, except that that is actually an unstable fixed point. If we were to start right next to it, we would run away uh, from it. And if we start somewhere else, we're going to get into this period two behavior uh, where we're jumping between two uh, different values of uh, x. So this, by the way, is uh, xn, and that is xn plus 1, just like uh, it was over here. So how can we understand uh, this sort of uh, period two behavior? And for that, uh, what we can do uh, is to go from uh, this mapping from xn to x plus xn plus one uh, to go for, to go from xn to xn plus two. Uh, so uh, that will be uh, a second iterate. So we're going to switch uh, to uh, xn plus two is equal to f of f of xn. That's what we're going to do. So when we plot the second iterate, uh, it actually looks uh, something like uh, that. So that's our xn plus 2 equal to xn. That's the diagonal. Uh, and uh, the second iterate looks like that. Let's see, I'm going to try and hope that I'm going to get it good. Right, Ooh, yes. Uh, it was supposed to be symmetric, but anyway, that's the best I can do here. Um, so uh, when we draw uh, this curve, uh, we're going to see, well, let me make it a little bit better. So let me make it a little bit more symmetric. Okay, so. That's how it can do it. All right. That's as good as I can make it today. OK, so uh, we are going to have those three fixed points, um, these ones that we're going to see here. Um, and uh, and uh, now you can see that these fixed points are actually uh, at the positions where xn plus 2 is equal to xn. And that's not surprising because we have hopped over uh, two steps instead of one. And so in period two behavior, we're going to be hopping over the same uh, behavior, um, either the even or the odd behavior. So that's why we have these fixed points at the intersections with xn plus 2 equal to xn diagonal curve. So these are indeed uh, the three fixed points. Um, so you can perform the same exact analysis for uh, period n behavior, where we would get an nth iterate 
uh, f of f of f n times of xn uh, to give you uh, xn plus the, the iterate, um, the, the, the number of the iterate. And that will allow you to explore what the fixed points are uh, for that higher order iterate uh, of the function. Um, what is really spectacular is uh, we can try and understand the behavior of uh, this uh, mapping by expanding the function f, uh, by expanding the first iterate around uh, the fixed point, uh, around this one. Uh, let's take a look at it and see in which cases the fixed point is stable and uh, uh, when it becomes unstable, just like here. So for that, we can uh, write down that xn is uh, xn plus 1 is equal to f of x star, which will be our fixed point, plus delta x. Uh, so that is nothing but xn. And uh, using Taylor expansion, we can approximately write this down as f of x star, uh, which will be just x star because it's a fixed point by the definition of x uh, fixed point, plus f. plus f prime at x star uh, times x n minus x star. And uh, what we are going to get from here, let me erase this. Is uh, that x n plus one minus x n uh, divided by x n minus x star, and uh, of course I don't know what I'm writing here anymore. This should be x star as well, right? x n plus one minus x star divided by x n minus x star. We're going to take the absolute values, of both numerator and denominator. That is going to be equal to the absolute value of f at uh, the fixed point, at x star. So that actually tells us that in order for the fixed point to be stable, um, that is the next uh, value in our sequence, xn plus 1, should be closer to the fixed point than the previous one. So this ratio should be less than 1. Therefore, the derivative or the absolute value of the derivative should be less than 1. So then a fixed point is stable. And uh, that is the condition for our fixed point to actually be stable. And so at the point, <laughs> at the point, uh, no pun intended, uh, when this condition no longer holds, our fixed point loses its stability and period doubling happens. Um, so the solution runs away from the fixed point and establishes two new uh, fixed points um, with period two behavior. And so that means that the behavior of this derivative in the vicinity of the fixed point determines how the transition to chaos happens. And this is precisely what was investigated by Fagelbaum in 1978. Uh, he looked uh, at this universal transition to chaos um, because almost any system can be represented through its Taylor expansion. If Taylor expansions look similar, then all of the systems 
um, can have a chance to show universal transition to chaos. And that is uh, the idea that you can almost always expand the system uh, around the fixed point uh, as long as the function is smooth. And you can that way establish the universality of the transition to chaos. So that's all I'm going to tell you about this today. Thank you so much for the attention. I hope this was fun. And I'm going to see you in lecture 10, uh, where are we going to start uh, completely new topics of waves. I'm going to get to talk to you about that. Super excited about this. See you very soon.